How are we doing? <laughs> this one will go in a minute. Shall I set it off? I first met the photographer, Steve Shipman, in 2013, and I want to share some pictures of him and of his before I introduce you properly in just a moment. Bear with. He came on a workshop I was hosting about still images and sound combined. It was the first workshop I'd hosted for photographers. I'd been shooting professionally less than a decade. He'd been photographing considerably more. He was the ninth name to book on, and I made some notes about him. I wrote, very proficient photographer, really nice chap too. But Steve is so much more than that, and I'm pleased he granted me his considerably proficient time back in 2013, because although I didn't know it then, I'd just fortuitously bumped into a one in a million type person. I think if you asked anybody lucky enough to be his friend, you'd probably find one word appear more than any other when asked to describe this really nice chap, giving. Because despite all the people he's photographed, the stories he's told, the newspapers and magazines that have shared his work all over the globe, and even the fact seven photographs of his feature within the National Portrait Gallery's collection, arguably the most important British archive for photographers and photography. Despite all that, he's never too busy if you call. I've not heard him belittle, run down, or decry another's work, or most importantly, passion for the business or art of photography. And whilst nobody can be that perfect, I'm sure, if ever you did partake in that thumbs-down style depreciation that's become a new and sadly acceptable currency of social discourse, he'll just disarm you with a glint in his eye and knowing look that says, are you sure you don't want to rephrase that last sentence into something, well, kinder? This is Steve, Steve Shipman, a very proficient photographer and a really nice chap too. Do you remember your, your first camera? Yes, I do. It was a, a Canon FTB and it came about because I had a job on a building site for my first sort of summer holiday as a 16 year old and I earned a fortune. I earned enough money to buy a really good camera and a really good hi-fi system. And actually, to be honest, I used the hi-fi system far more once I'd bought it than I did the camera. Um, the camera stayed on the shelf for months afterwards before I sort of thought, mm, maybe I should have a go with it, otherwise it is wasted money. I wasn't really heading in any direction, really. I know my dad would have liked me to have had a proper job with a salary. Um, but um, I was artistic, I liked drawing, I liked designing things, I drew cars endlessly. Um, but I tried out the camera and we had a pet dog and of course I photographed the dog and then I photographed flowers in the garden and then we went for a walk and I photographed ducks by the lake. I've still got the pictures actually, I can show you them if you want. Um, and it was a revelation. I was lucky enough to have an enlightened art master in a very otherwise very academic school who I could ask about photography and I said, I showed him a Vogue magazine actually and I said, do people earn money doing this? Is it possible to earn a living taking photos? And he said yes. He had a nephew who was a commercial photographer. He said absolutely it is. And my path was set. Most of the London photographers that I knew about, the commercial photographers, had assistants. Most of them had studios, full-time assistants. Some of them had a PA working with them. They all had agents. And they were big names. And I was lucky enough to work for one of them. Photography has changed my history completely. I've been a photographer shooting on film and I've seen that change into shooting on digital. In the days of shooting film, I remember crowding around light rooms at Joe's Basement or Metro um, and everybody was very guarded. They'd look at the, you know, you can't look at my stuff. You know, well, how'd you get that effect? I'm not telling you. It was all terribly guarded. And I've never felt that way inclined. I've always wanted to share my ideas and digital, in this digital age of sharing everything, it's a gift and I think, you know, being able to share ideas and techniques with other photographers is something I really enjoy doing. How are we doing? <laughs> this one will go in a minute. Shall I set it off? That one's next. <laughs> What's a Steve Shipman photograph? I like symmetry in a photo. I like clean lines. I love things that are just balanced. So there's an element in the frame which corresponds with something else in the frame that makes it even. So I like simplicity. Um, in my portraits, I've always gone for strong headshots. I believe that expressions convey huge amounts of meaning. 
And in my wedding work, I try to keep shots uncluttered where possible. So there's a clear background, or we use depth of field to blur the background so the subject stands out. In my personal work, which I shoot a bit of these days, sort of street photography, I look for shapes and lines. And again, I'm looking for balance and symmetry, light and dark. And I suppose that's more of the signature for my kind of thing. Uh, a lot of photographers I know love busy, cluttered pictures, and I do like looking at them, but I don't tend to take them myself. Sometimes it's the positioning of the subject that, well, obviously it will affect the photo. Margaret Thatcher gave me her situation. She said, we're going to shoot it here, and so I had to shoot it right there. So not my ideal scenario. But again, it's a simple situation. There's a, there's a wall with some, you know, balustrade behind her or something. It's fairly soft and nondescript, so she stands out from the background nicely. So I was happy with that. And a lot of my celebrity headshots are quite simple. They're on plain backgrounds. Occasionally, there were moments where we had agents and minders and assistants sort of looking at their watches and saying, you know, you've got five more minutes, 30 seconds. I remember doing Claudia Schiffer, dream job in those days. She was a big named model. She just put out a DVD, a Keep Fit DVD, and we were photographing her in a hotel, as one does, and she would not take the DVD down from beside her face. There was no way I was gonna get my clean headshot of her, beautiful as she is. She held it there, or she held it there, or it was there. It might have been like that. She would not budge, and that was such a shame. But a lot of the time, my subjects were more than willing to stand in front of me and just be themselves and that is the most important thing. I did a picture of Dustin Hoffman which was very early on in my series of black and white portraits as it became and he said well what do you want me to do and I said just look at me and he just looked at me and I got the most brilliant revealing real portrait of him which to this day I'm very proud of. I was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time. I was one of about a dozen photographers that all those magazines used all the time. And the art director of the Radio Times actually said to me once, whenever you're not shooting, ring me and we'll give you a job. I was lucky to be that busy for about 15 years. And it was a fabulous time for me. We were very fortunate, this was before I had the children. Um, so Amanda and I really did very well in those early days. In fact, it enabled me to buy the studio ultimately. Without wishing to plunder well-worn cliches or seasoned chestnuts, it does seem fitting that Steve's Behind Each Great Man story features a woman he's been with since teenage years. I met Amanda at a Saturday night church hall disco, as they used to be called. I'd just finished my Saturday job, actually. Uh, I was, my mum and dad suggested that I might like to study a bit more for my O-levels. And um, so I stopped the job and went out that night with a mate from the shop I'd worked in to see what we could do. And I saw this girl dancing on the dance floor and she looked lovely. She was just absorbed in her own, you know, movements and just having a lovely time. And I thought, she looks, she looks nice. <laughs> in my sort of little 16 year old, my nearly 16 year old, I was 15 still. So I did pluck up the courage to go and say, you're a great dancer, would you like a drink? And she said, no thanks, I've just had one. Which would have flattened any less keen young man. But I said, well, I'm having a drink, come and, have a, come and be with me anyway. And she did, bless her. And anyway, we got to know each other and she was 14 that summer and I was just about to be 16. So this was in the September. Uh, I was 16 in the October and Bar one year gap while we were at uni, we've been together ever since. What is it about Amanda? <laughs> <laughs> She's a very strong, wise woman. We talk a lot. We walk and talk a lot. It's something we've always done, with or without a dog. We've walked and talked. And that's the strength, I think, of our relationship. We just talk through everything. We always have done. What is it about her? She's a very wise, understanding, considerate and patient person. She's kept us together as a family. She's the glue that does hold us together. She's an absolute pillar of strength for the girls. And she's the rock for me. 
So occasionally, in the days of celebrity photography, I would approach people myself and ask them if I could photograph them for this series. And Leslie Crowther was one of the characters that I hadn't been asked to photograph for a magazine, but I got in touch with him. And he was such a lively character because he was a very successful te children's television presenter. And I wanted to capture that in this portrait of him. And if you look closely, you can see his hand has actually moved during the exposure, which was deliberate because I wanted to convey that sense of, well, I don't know, manic movement that he's so known for, or was known for, uh, when he was on stage. So Joan Collins was a commission for the Sunday Express magazine. It's one of a series of portraits of women taken in a nightclub in London called Annabelle's. And for this portrait, we set up lots of lights, lots of background. It was very glamorous. And the original went off in colour to the magazine and I kept this black and white back for me. And I'm particularly pleased with it. She took hours in makeup, but eventually appeared and sat very graciously for my camera. And as I say to a lot of my subjects, just look at me. And she gave me just the most beautiful look and she's got the most beautiful arm and face. And you know, she's no spring chicken, but she looks really good in this photograph and I'm really pleased with it. It was always a delight to photograph a celebrity who arrived on his own, as he did. So many celebrities arrived with their managers and their agents and their assistants. And he turned up as if he was just a, a, a humble actor, you know, you having appeared in his first film. In I fact, you know, Sir Anthony Hopkins um, graced our presence in the studio. And I just, once again, I asked him to be himself in front of my camera. He thought it was very odd that I asked him to put his Macintosh raincoat back on because I loved the textures in it. And I just said, look at me. This is a good example of a picture that needed no direction whatsoever. This is a very angry Lenny Henry on the set of a TV production that he was involved in, starring as an angry young man. But he did not enjoy the process of uh, having to endure publicity photography. So I had about 30 seconds with him uh, in which he stood in front of the camera, glared at me and then walked away. I was asked to photograph Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer for a Sunday magazine. And a day or two beforehand, I was able to ring them and ask them if they wanted me to bring in any props. So off the top of their heads, they just said, um, some stuffed animals and some salamis. So although there's no salami in this picture, there is a stuffed crocodile. And for about two and a half hours, I and my assistant were the audience for their two-man show. We were very fortunate. We had a good sort of 10 years or so at our careers. I was establishing myself as a photographer. She worked for a TV company at the time. And then we decided to start our family. And of course, at that time, I thought, well, I'm going to buy a studio as well and move house. So <laughs> all within a few months, um, Amanda gave birth to Eleanor, our oldest daughter. Uh, I bought the studio and we moved house. And um, that was a, you know, followed by a few traumatic years, I have to say. Maddie arrived three years later. And, um, and we did have, it was, I mean, God, it was a lot of fun. They were fantastic daughters and we enjoyed every second with them. Eleanor is very artistic. She's very ambitious, very focused on what she wants. She's very fussy and very particular. I know she won't mind me saying. Maddie is very uh, gregarious and outgoing. She loves a party. She's got hundreds of friends. And somehow that mix of Eleanor's sort of uh, intellectual intensity meshes with Maddie's ebullience and they get on very, very well indeed. And we are very blessed with that. So I talked earlier about the kind of shots I like to take. And these are a good example of how I like symmetry in a picture. So almost every one of these has a balancing element on each side of the subject um, to convey partly the atmosphere of the room, those who are present, but also to set a stage for something that's happening right in the middle of each picture. So this poor groom who's absolutely in tears here, just behind him out of focus, walks his lovely bride up to, to meet him. And I love the framing of that because he's in slightly to one side, but she's out of focus. So your eye automatically swaps between the two of them. 
A famous photographer called Henri Cartier-Bresson talked about the decisive moment. And very often in weddings, you are waiting for a moment where the action is at its peak. I think wedding photography is intense, but I'd been used to long days of photography anyway. And most of the editorial, and some of the corporate, but most of the editorial I shot was a one-off chance. You only had that one chance to photograph the Prime Minister or that actor because he was in the country or that person because they weren't available any other time. And weddings are similar. You have the same pressure because it's a non-repeatable event. You, d you don't have another chance to go back and reshoot it. And I didn't with the work I'd done professionally beforehand. So I was used to the pressure and I was used to the long days. I was used to being alert and up upbeat for that many hours until the job was done and then you can sag and have a cup of tea, but um, I was used to the pressure, so it didn't bother me at all. I recorded these thoughts from Steve about his work and family at the start of spring 2017, four years almost to the day after first meeting him, and a month after receiving what I think of as that phone call from one of his dearest friends and colleagues, Phil, with the news that Steve was unwell. And without wishing to be too descriptive, the kind of unwell that forces words to whisper, as if to deny they'd been uttered at all. And so, Steve's film is a legacy in some respects, but the beauty of this thing that we do, making photographs, and then making stories from those fractions of a second for which the shutter is opened, is such that whatever nature throws down as a gauntlet can't deny what we've made, that the absoluteness of a still-captured moment remains just that, forever. Coming up to the year 2000, I was thinking about the millennium and special projects and things that were significant at that time. And I was literally sitting in the bath when I had the idea to do a series of portraits of my extended family. And I decided that it might be fun to have everybody holding something that meant something to them, a significant object. So we ended up shooting individual portraits of 50 or so people each holding something, and then we wrote a few words about it to sort of complete the portrait. I think personal projects are important for me now. There was a time when I was shooting professionally when I didn't have the energy. The weekends, I just wanted to be away from photography. Our summer holiday photos were taken by my wife, and I was, you know, I was tired. But these days, I, I feel a bit more enthusiastic. It's partly because of the digital revolution. I think it's transformed how we work our ownership of our pictures, we can process them how we want to, the sharing idea, which I mentioned earlier, talking with each other about how we do things, has been fantastic. And I love the community aspect of, of shooting personal work. You can go out with people and take pictures on the street, and it's just great to compare ideas and think about stuff that you shoot together. So my personal work is mostly street photography. It's very rarely people. I'm not a bold street photographer. I don't find photographing people on the street very easy. I find it a bit confrontational. So my street photography tends to be looking for light, looking for shadows, looking for balance, looking for colours. And that is the direction I've found that pleases me most. And I post them in a personal journal on my website. Everybody thought it was great fun, providing they didn't have to organise it. So Amanda and I organised it. There's me holding my significant object, which of course is a camera. 15 years later, we decided to do the same project again, partly motivated by some of our relatives becoming quite elderly. So here we have in the second volume, done in 2015, my daughter Eleanor, proudly holding her notebooks that she has collected and filled over the years of being an art student and subsequently working as a professional artist. Slightly different format with these pictures. I shot them on a 35mm equivalent digital camera. And this is shot in her now hometown of Bristol. Maddie lived at the time we shot this in Brighton, which she absolutely loved. She was also a very keen runner. So this is what she says. After much debate about what to hold as my thing for this project, I came to the conclusion that I have no current thing. I'm just doing my thang. And in many ways, that does sum up Maddie so much. She very much heartily does her thing. So to commemorate the completion of this book, we staged a big family party in a hall and invited everybody. And amazingly, everybody came. Photographing the people I relate to and feel comfortable with, whether they're related or not, it has been a thoroughly enjoyable project. And yes, it brings me back full circle to 
starting out when I was a professional photographing my own family. Being a photographer is a great enabler. It has allowed me into people's lives. It's allowed me to connect with people. It's allowed me to reconnect people. And it has allowed me to be with people. People I love, people who I like being with, people who interest me, and people who just have interesting lives in their own ways. It's been a great privilege to be a photographer and I don't regret a sing single second of my career. I've enjoyed every minute. I'll miss it. <laughs>